I'd like to welcome everybody to this episode of White Skinned, the podcast where white people talk about race and social constructs and politics, history, all that good stuff. Uh, the idea is to, you know, foster greater connection and to and to work through all these issues that uh, folks not tend in our community tend not to have to talk about as much as everybody else. So anyway, I'm really excited to talk to my first guest here today. So we're just going to dive right in. Uh, he's an award-winning author, lecturer, professor of sociology at the University of Connecticut. He frequently uh, opines as an expert witness for discrimination cases. Uh, he's often seen on ABC, Al Jazeera, CNN, Fox, NPR, New York Times, USA Today, all the big ones. And you've written a lot of books. You've done a lot of stuff. So this is your this is your field of, of interest, your field of passion. And, um, and you, you know, your award-winning book, White Bound, Nationalist, Anti-Racist, and the Shared Meanings of Race uh, 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 by Stanford University Press. So please join me in welcoming Matthew Huey. Hey, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You know, playing these, having these conversations and having these uh, discussions with people like yourself who are, who, are, who have such a, a good knowledge base of bigger systems and information like that. I think that's that's super important. And sociology in particular is there's a big swath of the population that looks at universities and education in this way as you know this liberal elite and you know you're you're castigated and nobody wants to pay attention once they find out even university in general now is kind of looked at like why are you you don't listen to these people they're biased. I was talking to a guy the other day about studies about this and systemic racism when we were talking about things. And he said, well, studies are biased. You're gonna get whatever you uh, want. You're gonna find the answers without the knowledge that you know you have mechanisms built into studies and scientific method. That's how we get all of our, uh, our latest medical information. You know, you have uh, controls and all these things in place, but when it comes to social research, you have, and I think since the history of sociology, you've always had people who have fought against the idea that sociology you know, taken like a science or taken as seriously. There's, there's been that struggle in some ways, but I think now, you know, there's, there's definitely a lot of pushback on education in general and social education. What, what's the bias? What's the point here? You're trying to use my money to give it to somebody else that's not working. You're trying to, uh, you're trying to make us separated by talking about these situations. And these, if we just would forget all that and just go by common sense, then we'd all get along and we wouldn't have any of these issues, which obviously is fraught with all kinds of issues. I mean, there's an erosion of trust right, with the public and, and our key institutions, whether it's the economy or media or higher education, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, sociology in some ways has merited this. I mean, the roots of sociology are that of a incredibly racist, sexist, classist field, right? I mean, it is not hard at all <laughs> to make uh, these claims when you just read some of the early articles published in the American Journal of Sociology or the American Sociological Review, right? The, mm -hmm. the flagship journals of the field. Um, it is blatantly racist and just rife with ideological propaganda, right? Yeah. But I think that there are many that work within academe and higher education that avoid that, that attempt to do unbiased work, that attempt to do good work, that attempt to do work that is quote unquote objective and seeks truth regardless of where truth will take you, regardless mm -hmm. of its implications. Mm -hmm. That's a courageous, important endeavor. So I don't want anyone to mistake what I'm about to say, <laughs> right? <laughs> because, you know, I work in that area. I, I support it. I believe in it, right? It's important, especially for educating young people. Yeah. You need to be able to teach them the tools to separate truth from fiction. Mm -hmm. But when you have a public that is hostile to truth, that doesn't trust those institutions, and in some ways is merited for that, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why should poor white people trust higher education? Higher education has not done much for poor white folks, mm -hmm. right? Why should folks of color in many ways trust higher education, right? Mm -hmm. When they've been used as the subjects and in many ways the victims for scientific progress. Mm -hmm. right? So when we look at the place of academe in our society today, 
are we making it more open and more usable and more understandable to the public? Or are we kind of doubling down and using more and more impenetrable language with more and more journals that are super expensive that you can't even access because you can't pay the cost to read the stuff yeah. when more and more of the funding in and of itself because the public doesn't trust higher ed is being withheld so we have to turn to private industry which then only makes the public doubt our objectiveness because we're being paid by private industry it's a cycle yeah yeah that's and again we need that dual transformation can we make remake higher education in a way that's more transparent, that's more affordable, that's more accessible, and more usable for people to better their lives, right? Mm -hmm. Whether you're talking about sociology or you're talking about agriculture or you're talking about business, whatever field you're talking about, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then be able to make that into a kind of public good right, in which people can see the benefit of it, just as they would see the benefit of clean air, clean water, health care, or whatnot, right? So is that, but, that, but again, that, we live in such a strange, weird world in which even health care is used for profit, right, that we yeah, don't even right. consider that a human right. So we got a long way to go. Well, as we're talking about America, you know, is in Europe, do you think that there's a different trust of, of academia because of the uh, affordability of you know, the poorest person in Sweden can be a doctor just like the richest person with without the same problems. Do they have more of a, you know, more of a trust of everything? I, I'd probably say they do. In, in many measurable ways, like like surveys of happiness of trusted institutions and so forth. There are many European models as, and I don't want to just fetishize like, you know, the the, the Nordic countries, which are often pointed to, right? right there's right. many, there's many South American and African and, and global South institutions and states that do this as well, um, that just have more trust and more happiness, right, mm -hmm. in their institutions. Although there is a global trend that's been going on over the past kind of couple decades, in which happiness and trust in public institutions is is dwindling, right? Mm. Um, so these models are in some ways failing us, whether that's because of the growing global gap between rich and poor, in which the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer and there are more of them. The middle class is disappearing. Mm -hmm. The color line is actually strengthening in many ways over the globe, especially in bigger cities where our bigger cities are becoming just as segregated, if not more segregated than they were in the 1940s and 50s. Mm -hmm. Right? It may shock people to learn that we were the most integrated in the United States in the late 80s. Mm. That was our high point of integration. Wow. Right? <laughs> that was as best as it ever got. That is crazy. And it's beginning worse since. So, yeah, there are models out there that I think show a different way that it could be. Mm -hmm. um, but those also show signs of, of weakening too. Well, it's, it's funny, you talk about it, and I think bureaucracy and the extension of capitalism getting more and more disparate as part of the, I mean, it's kind of the trend that people have talked about historically that that's gotta go in that direction at some point. And the further and further along we get along there, there's, there's gonna be some breaking point or some point where some new systems have to be created, whatever you wanna call that at some point, it's not sustainable if heading along that. And I think the bureaucracy becoming more and more rigid also may play into some of that because you need those things to solidify in order for people to keep uh, keep hoarding. But what I what I was interested in what you were saying when you talked about um, you know uh, different cultures and different countries. Obviously, cultures humans have been around for hundreds of thousands of years, and there have been cultures that have been doing the same thing for fifty thousand years, sixty thousand years that are still on the planet and systems of being with the world and with people. And through white supremacy, we have pretty much focused on this very small, narrow group of information, uh, the, the European thought or white male in particular, your thought about how to organize the world and how to organize our systems. Um, and, and it's kind of driving us to this point where not having all heads at the table to create policy, you know, you got global warming, you got all these changes that are happening to the planet pretty rapidly. I mean, you know, is there a fear there that without tackling white supremacy or tackling these issues of race that we could destroy ourselves? I mean, in my mind, I know it sounds pretty, it sounds a little big, but in my mind, that's kind of, it's, it's that serious to me. 
I agree with you. It is that serious, right? It is that serious. Um, it's not just a question, will we destroy ourselves? I mean, we have been. Right. Right? Um, World War I was in large part caused. I mean, we have this story that, you know, the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand is what set off World War I. Right. It, it was the European competition for the conquest of, of Africa, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. that, that led to World War I. Right. Um, World War II was in large part the United States fighting white supremacy in Europe and using white supremacy against Japan, mm -hmm. right? Um, so many of our global conflicts have been over questions of race and ethnicity. The Civil War, I mean, obviously the, the big one here. Yeah, all the, it seems like all those things have been around white supremacy and race and <laughs> you're you know, right. And, and race itself is a fairly new concept in the history of the world, right? It's mm -hmm. only at best about 400 or so years. And, it, mm -hmm. and historians and social scientists for the most part agree that it was kind of a creation as a way of rationalizing European colonialism and, and, mm -hmm. and settler colonialism in particular. Mm -hmm. um, but we've always found ways of othering people, whether it's by religion or by language and so forth. And the othering process is a process of dehumanization. Right? Mm -hmm. If I can dehumanize you, then killing you is not a big deal, right? Sure. It's, I can sleep well at night, mm -hmm. right? If I don't think you're human, mm -hmm. right? if I kill you because I actually think it's good, because God is on my side, mm -hmm. because biologically you're not human, whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. I can rationalize it and justify it. Race is the current manifestation of that othering, dehumanizing process that has taken place at the same time that the world has actually become conscious of itself as a planet, mm -hmm. right? With the colonial project. Mm -hmm. And so now you have thousands and thousands of years of the kind of perfected science of dehumanizing and killing people that is manifested in this concept that we call race. Mm -hmm. And it is killing ourselves. It's not a question of whether it will, it is. Mm -hmm. And when you look at how race manifests in terms of uh, environmental racism, of how mm -hmm. we're destroying the planet and we're largely doing that on the backs and with the blood of people of color. When you look at the intersection of race and poverty, when you look at the kind of intersectional and gendered components of racism and which women of color far more bear the brunt of oppression than men, although men are hurt in some different ways too. I don't wanna, you know, paint a picture that you know men just completely benefit we are killing ourselves right physically and spiritually right mm -hmm. we have dehumanized ourselves and are destroying the planet we live on and the people that live upon it right mm -hmm. and most of us sleep well at night contributing toward that mm -hmm. that's the scary part right that is we scary. don't hear the alarm bells we don't see the sirens. We don't see the warning signs. Mm -hmm. And that, that makes this work so much more. I mean, it just gives it outside the fact that a lot of people have been dying for a long time based upon this. It really threatens every every person, animal, every the whole planet. I mean, you know, you look at it, it, it that's how that's how powerful that is. I mean, I, you know, it just it just makes you kind of wonder what what will it take for people to take on this project in a way that, you know, we can reconnect again. And it's, it's almost a re, without racism, the system is not the same. There's life as we know it is not the same, right? I mean, you can't have three cars, two TVs, uh, you can't have mangoes in the middle of winter without racism, right? So what, how does the world look as you deconstruct it? So what do you gain and what do you lose? I mean, you may gain things that now you don't, you, you, you think, oh, if I get this new car, I'll be happy. If I get this new outfit, I need three outfits a month or this jewelry, I'm going to be happy. And we all know as it doesn't make you happy necessarily. It may temporarily give you a little bit of good feeling, but that doesn't give contentment to a human being. And But it's such a fear to give up the luxuries that we've kind of been accustomed to. I mean, the whole system is based upon racism and based upon consumption and they, they go hand in hand. So then it becomes, what does the world look like? How do we, how do we envision the next phase of things and kind of work towards that or without 
I mean, you know, how do you create that bridge that we need to save ourselves? Because basically that's what it's coming to. Like we need it. It's going to look totally different, whether we like it or not. You know, either it's going to do it to us or we're going to do it to ourselves. Oh, the, 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 our whole reality is going to be changed at some point. And it doesn't feel like not too far off of in the future, you know? Yeah, I think uh, yeah. that it's going to take something cataclysmic to, to shake us out of our patterns, right? I mean, the globe, but just looking at the United States, right, has an immense amount of wealth, right? We have learned how to create an incredible amount of wealth, technological advances, all kinds of things that were unimaginable a century ago, right? I mean, I can't imagine what things will be in another hundred years that we can't even imagine now, right? right. Um, the right. stuff that science fiction can't even come up with yet, mm -hmm. right? So the wealth is there, right? Another world is possible. We can see that materially. That's not a pipe dream. There is enough wealth on the planet that everyone could live a comfortable, dignified life. Mm -hmm. So we could do it. We could have our mangoes, right? We could <laughs> have our jewelry. We could have nice clothes. We could all have zero to near zero emissions cars, right? We could mm -hmm. do that. But it does mean, as you said, that the current system will not allow that, mm -hmm. right? There will be people that have to give up some things, but most people will gain some things, mm -hmm. right? So there are signs, right? Even as messed up as the world is, when you look over the past century, you see signs of like the absolute levels of poverty, like there's relative poverty measures, there's absolute mm -hmm. poverty measures. Right. Absolute measures of poverty have, are, are, are not as bad as they used to be, mm -hmm. right? Things have gotten a bit better on an absolute scale, Life even as extremes enough. of wealth and poverty mm -hmm. have gotten worse. Sure. Right? Relative poverty has gotten worse, right? So we sh show signs of what we can do if we want to do it, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm afraid that most people are too distracted or too fearful or simply are, um, are unaware and, and scared of, of how to do it and don't know how to do it, right? Mm -hmm. So to me, it becomes a matter of our collective will, right? How can we reach beyond our current parameters? For me, a lot of those answers have been found when we listen to the people, um, as in, Enrique Dussel said, who's, a, who's a, um, a social theorist, when we listen to the people on the underside of modernity, right? Mm -hmm when we listen to the historically systemic losers of this battle, right? When we listen to those folks, when we read their theories, when we read their ideas, when we learn from them, it largely has not been a revenge project, mm -hmm. right? African-American theory, for example, social theory, political theory, economic theory has not been, let's go kill the white people and take all their things. Mm -hmm. It's been, how can we get along and have a dignified common existence for everyone? Mm -hmm. You know, the ironic thing is that black political theory has been more all lives matter than black lives matter. Right? That's crazy. It's an That's interesting funny. thing, right? Yeah, it's right, been trying right. to, you know, a, a rising tide lifts all boats. Yeah, sure. You know? But we don't, most white folks don't want to hear that. Right? Yeah. They're scared of it. They don't know how to acknowledge it. They don't even know how to take a back seat to it. Well, it's almost like you don't know what you don't know. You don't know how great it could be. You know, you don't know. You're taught that this is it. Like even you talk about wealthy people or people who have all this resource, they also have a hard time connecting with people, being close to people because they're afraid. So people are asking them for stuff that, they, you know, you can't have everybody coming up to your door. People are trying to rob you. People are trying to, I got this fly around here. Good night. It keeps landing on my face. But you don't realize that that you can life could be better for you too. Like it's not just that's the that's what you're sold is the best thing ever. But you still you can, you have a hard time having relationships. You look at all these wealthy guys that can't keep a marriage or can't keep a every billionaire in the world. I think is going through a divorce right now. I mean, it's like you know, it doesn't necessarily equate to your happiness. And even the weight of you having billions of dollars to come make the world a better place. Who wants that responsibility as a one person to say, I'm going to come up with the answers to shit just because I got a billion dollars, you know, or I'm going to, 
I get to mete out this money to whoever I feel is worthy. And I mean, that's not even something that sounds like fun <laughs> to do with your day, you know, I mean, as opposed to working with everybody and kind of everybody coming up collectively with decisions and we kind of work together or people laughing at your jokes and they're not funny or people won you over, even though they don't like you. There's so much of that in that class of people where they get, you know, like you look at the Donald Trumps where you just, you get this, you know that you're not as, at what, what, as great as everybody's making out to be, but there's that insecurity that comes in. Well, everybody's laughed at me. I've, they, they all want to be around me for all these years. So there's this confusion. It just seems like, but you, but you're also placed on this, on this pedestal. So how do you, you know, how do you step it down from the pedestal without knowing, is this going to be better for me? You know, uh, convincing people that, even we talk about white people and whiteness, how do you say if we reconnect and we kind of can, can rearrange how we're looking at the world, we can have a better life. We can have a more connected life. We don't have to be, we don't have to carry this, this, uh, this elevation that we know is not necessarily, or looking down on people that we consider humans like us. We don't have to carry that. It can be better. Life could be better for all of us if we were to give up these things. You know, it, it could, I agree with you. I think one of the meeting grounds for these dual processes of changing hearts and minds and also changing social structures is through the narratives that we tell, right? Mm, there are facts, there are things that exist objectively so, but how we tell stories about them, how we make meaning of them is a very subjective thing, right? Mm -hmm. So that we don't even know what the objective factness of a thing actually is. It's all about how we tell a story about it. Right. Yeah, even even trying to agree on what does exist or not right it can be a contentious thing sure. and some of the stories that we have out there right are seductive stories that kind of recruit white people into these roles of being the saviors of being the philanthropists of being mm -hmm. that role right this kind of white savior mentality right um the stories that we tell right i was i i constantly see this story for example in the papers and in news media and so forth right and, and it frames it like here's this unequal situation in which someone has too much of something and some people have not enough of it. And this person comes in and somehow gets that person to give something to the people. And isn't it great? And we concentrate on how moral and loving and giving and caring that benefactor is and how grateful the people who get that are and then what they're going to do with their lives because of it and we tie a nice bow on that and we shed a little tear and it's a great story right mm -hmm. it's a morality tale it's how we tell a lot of movies it's how we tell stories it's how we report objective facts in the news mm -hmm. right instead of that being a story of the exact same facts of what's going on it could be a story of look how our system has failed us that it requires people to come in and save other people look how the system has failed us to make so unequal things that there are in fact philanthropists mm -hmm. that can come in and because they simply care can give a lot of money but if they don't care they're off hoarding it which is what most right. people do so we yeah. then tell a great story about how different this person is than most of the rich people who hoard this money and then tell a story oh gosh wouldn't it be great if more people just gave mm -hmm. <laughs> instead of wouldn't it be great if there weren't as many people to give because not as many people need it yeah right? that's yeah that's big. so we don't tell a story of the reallocation of wealth yes, that sounds yes. scary that sounds socialist that sounds all these things mm -hmm. instead of again that can be told is that a story of socialism or is that a story for some people of being christ-like yeah right however you tell that story right, matters right. a lot Right. And so, story, yeah. yeah, so so our, our storytelling is incredibly biased, is incredibly, um, I think, based in a fiction that that kind of morality tale will save us all. When mm -hmm. in fact, it's the it's the it's the story and the, the implication of those stories that are hurting us the most. And, and what? Yeah. And, and who's telling the story? I mean, the stories, even since the advent of mass media and the television, and all that, it was advertising that told the story, our moral stories, right, to our to the people, as opposed to our local communities who told stories that uh, that taught kids morals and things that we wanted to have happen in the community that served the people. The storytelling got taken over by these big uh, conglomerates with with 
with the intention of selling products. So all of their morality tales went back to, you need to buy these things or you need to consume more of this stuff. So the stories we're getting from above are now like these big homogenized stories that don't have anything to do with local or, or you know, how to make our world a better place. They all serve an interest of people who are telling these big stories, right? On some levels. And I mean, this how do you, is, yeah. Yeah, this has been, I mean, folks need to pay attention to the history of mass media. I mean, literally, if you look at the radio, there's a certain amount of bandwidth that mm -hmm. goes from like, you know, 88 up to 107 or something like that, right? By federal law, it used to be that a large percentage of that, right, even if that one frequency was owned by a particular station over a certain area, they had to allocate certain hours of that for the public good, for public mm -hmm. access, so that people mm -hmm. could, not for profit, but for the public good. And over time, that amount of public sharing and space for the public good has been chopped and chopped and chopped and whittled and whittled down to almost nothing. Yeah, yeah right? sure. The channels that we do have, like national public radio or public broadcasting system, everything, have been underfunded more and more and more mm -hmm. and chopped down more and more and more. So they have less and less influence. So we don't even have a place for telling stories about the public good. All our stories, to your point, are how can we move a product? How can we sell a thing? Right. And people don't people question the the intention of national public radio it's a liberal bias or or who's tearing down these statues they uh I, i'm afraid of the power that these people have to say i don't like this guy and i'm going to tear it down but they don't question the power it took to put those statues up you know they don't question the power it takes to create this, those stories that they're so used to and that's the power that is the scary thing you know on some levels just because it's created for division as opposed to the people who may say hey this statue i don't you know and then not to touch on another you know get into another topic which i think is fascinating in itself too but but there's not a questioning of who had the power to put this statue up in 1950 when these situations were taking place why is that power not questioned in the states and the capitals and we're not analyzing, you know, why did they do this and what was the intention of doing that as opposed to, hey, this is offensive and these things happen, we'd like to take this down, you can go put it in a park or put it in a cemetery, you can still look at it, but we don't want it in our public sphere. Um, that kind of power now is being like, I'm afraid of that. I'm afraid of the power of the people to take things down. I'm afraid of cancel culture and, and not the culture that, put those offensive things in there in the first place. That's interesting too, to me. Yeah, all these, yeah, all fears, these fears, I think, are, are in some ways merited, even as they are reactionary, right? Like people are afraid of, of cancel culture, right? Without exactly to your point of seeing like, well, what are they trying to cancel? How long has that been around? Why is that there? And, and why might they feel fearful of that, right? Mm -hmm cancel culture in some ways is an overreaction to many of the ways in which mainstream social institutions have not dealt out justice, have not dealt out equality, right? And there's going to be this continuing kind of backlash back and forth in so long as there's inequality, you know, mm -hmm. one movement will gain ascendance for a while and then there'll be a backlash to it. And then we call that cancel culture, right? Yeah, and then right. it'll swing back the other way and we'll call that, you know, make America great again or whatever mm -hmm. we want to call it, right? And it goes back and forth and back and forth because it's about competition and winning. It's not about understanding yeah. or it's, it's not even about the recognition that that media space for the public sphere should be the meeting ground in which people can actually come together mm -hmm. and practice democracy, right? If we look at the root words of democracy, demos and krasia, which literally means people and power or power to the people, it mm -hmm. should be a place in which the public are empowered to have a voice and a leading voice in how the government functions, right? but, but We have few places to do that. No, and I think it's not encouraged. It's encouraged that chaos and that swinging pendulum is encouraged because it creates, and it's, it's twofold or threefold. It creates revenue. People have to tune in and see this, see these uh, arguments and disagreements, but also keeps people from organizing, from coming together and taking on the powers that be. It's encouraged by, by people who benefit from having everybody, you know, kind of swinging and arguing and having these discussions. There's definitely, I mean emperors have been talking about they've been writing about this stuff for centuries right how to how to keep masses of people from being disorganized or chaotic or being not controllable i mean this is this is perfected over millennia right i mean 
uh, I mean, you look at the 60s and, and the upheaval that was taking place during the 60s, it was a lot of chaos. The government was trying to figure out how do we keep anarchy down? I mean, you got all these different groups. You got hippies, you got black power movements, you got the NBA, you got the women's right, you got all these powers be there getting all this new information and they're starting to demand changes to the fundamental changes to society. But that is, that's the worst fear of a government or of a king or of a dictator, right? They, I can't lose control of this. Otherwise, everything is done. Everything that I control is now out the window. So, you know, and I think that those people in positions like that have have honed those skills pretty well. I mean, we've we we the '60s really helped them zero in on how to how to control populations. But that has kind of been passed on, right? I think on some levels that people benefit off of our swinging pendulum and our discord on some levels. That's that's the media way to to benefit from it, right? Is to pitch it as these kind of two forces between you know progress and conservatism or whatever you want to call it. Um, but you know, many of the the social changes that have occurred and that people now benefit from. I mean, you know, social security when when this was first introduced under FDR and the New Deal was decried as socialism. Right, mm -hmm. as communism, as this thing that would ruin the country, mm -hmm. and now it's largely old conservative white folks that benefit from social security. Right, so <laughs> right, right. you know, um, I have a theory about this too. Right, as the country becomes more and more, um, or less and less white, and more and more filled with folks of color, and then those folks of color age and would would become the recipients of social of social security. Then all of a sudden, we'll find a way to get rid of social security. Right? Yeah, that seems to be the history of programs like yeah, that. Yeah, as soon as folks of color get their hands on it, then we got to get rid of it. But mm -hmm. um, but that's a that's a that's a media telling, right? The the civil rights movement uh, was in many ways a movement based not in just reaction, but in of trying to get ideals that are very in many ways American, right? Of, mm -hmm. of getting, you know, life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness of of trying to attain equality and justice uh, for people. So but the way that's told, uh, you're right, is, is one of, you know, just a seesawing back and forth.